I am rolling. Chaloop. For you. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And thank you for joining me once again, Biggie. Hey, no problem. I'm always down for some hot Doonstief action. <laughs> yeah. Hot Dune Steve action. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have a story for you today, folks. <laughs> uh, maybe that wasn't the best way to start off this episode. <laughs> well, no, 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 that's okay. Uh, you got to have a sense of humor to enjoy this episode. Yeah. But yeah, let's, let's not bury the lead. Let's uh, let people know why we're doing this episode. And, uh, or do you want me to, since I, I'm already running my mouth? Sure, that would work. So uh, this week we got the bad news, the sad news, that a friend of the show and uh, multi, multi award winning sci fi writer Mike Resnick passed away. Yeah. Uh, he died on the 9th of January, 2020, at the age of 77. And uh, I don't think I talked to you about it. I just assumed that you'd feel the same way as I did. That we'd wanted to do an episode where we talked about about Mike. And then we, we're in a unique situation in that Mike sent us a bunch of stories years ago that we just, we still have. And so uh, I wanted us to p- polish off one of those stories and put it out and then talk about him. And so that's why we're here tonight. Yeah, we wanted, uh, I guess, one one last chance to kind of, I don't know, I guess you could say we're eulogizing him or, or, or something like that. But, or you know, we wanted to express our appreciation because uh, one of the best things I think about Mike Resnick is that he has always been a big supporter of podcast fiction, going all the way back to when I first discovered podcast fiction and then coming forward on our own show. And so, yeah, we have a series of Mike Resnick stories that uh, that he sent to us. We've done several of them already. And uh, now uh, we, we thought we'd present one more of the stories in the series to uh, to you at home. And you can enjoy it and have a, have a, a chuckle. And then we'll talk about them on the other side. So today's story is Catastrophe Baker and the Siren of Silver Strike. And uh, yeah, it's it's another in the series of Catastrophe Baker stories that we have done. If you are interested, you can go back in our uh, archives and see the other stories. We did one of the stories live at New Media Expo in 2014. That one was Catastrophe Baker and the Ship Who Purred. And then we did uh, in January of 2012, Catastrophe Baker Makes First Contact. And in August of 2011, Catastrophe Baker and the Cold Equations... And then the original story that we did for him was Catastrophe Baker and a Canticle for Leibowitz in March of 2011. So yeah, you can go back and check those out and enjoy them. Uh, You can even go back and listen to them before listening to this episode if you want. Not that you need to, though. They're not tales that require the other one being heard before you can continue on or anything like that. They're basically space tall tales it's uh picos bill in space or something like that so we'll take you off to that story you can enjoy that and then we'll talk some more about mike on the other side Uh, should we warn people oh sure go ahead these stories a little bit body and uh hopefully if you're listening to the dune steve you're not easily offended and are going to take this in a bad way. But uh, if by chance you came here by mistake, let me reiterate, it was a mistake. 
that is all. <laughs> all right. We'll see you right after the story. Catastrophe Baker in the Siren of Silver Strike by Mike Resnick. It all began when I decided to pay a visit to my old friend, Bloody Ben Masters, who'd been the first one to hit pay dirt on Silver Strike. He'd made a few million credits off his silver mine, then sold it for a few million more, built himself a castle with an acid moat around it, and retired. When I got there, I learned that poor Ben was no longer among the living. Seemed he'd got a snootful one night and decided to see if he could swim the moat without taking a breath. He got the last part right because I don't believe there was enough left of him to breathe about three seconds after he dove in. Anyway, there I was with some time on my hands, so that night I moseyed into town to see what the locals did for entertainment besides jump each other's claims. And that's when I found old Doc Nebuchadnezzar's all-star carnival and thrill show. They had all the usual carny stuff, an old gravity ferris wheel, a tower of Babel for the men folk, and a Gamora palace for the ladies, a couple of fights to the death between Trambolians and a pair of the local men, a magician who volunteered to cut your spouse in half. I don't recall remembering him promising to put her back together, now that I come to think of it and the usual surgically altered six-armed jugglers and knife throwers and the like. But none of them especially interested me. In fact, I was about to leave when I heard a trumpet blare and a little guy in a bright plaid suit got up on a floating platform and announced that the moment we were all waiting for had arrived, and that anyone with 20 credits to spend could come into his bubble and see the siren of silver strike in all her sensual glory. Well, the last time I saw so many people move so fast all at once was when me and Bloody Ben had had one of our little disagreements back on Bilbao 2, and I threw a couple of poker tables through a window and demanded a little more fighting room. And he threw the bartender out after the tables and allowed that that was a right good idea. And I figured anyone or anything that got everyone so motivated was probably worth 20 credits and then some. So I gently shoved a few folks out of my way, tried not to listen over much to their howls of anger and agony, and forked over my money. Once I got inside the bubble, I kind of shouldered my way to the front, hardly discommoding anyone at all except six or seven men who refused to step aside as quick as they should have for a newcomer to their fair planet, and then I took a seat. I didn't have long to wait, because the second I sat down, the music started, and suddenly, the siren of Silverstrike appeared on stage. And you gotta believe me when I tell you that she was about as lovely a critter of the female persuasion as I'd ever seen up to that time. Her hair hung down almost to her waist, and it was striped with rows of iridescent colors. Red, blue, yellow, green, and the pattern repeated a couple of times. Real striking and artistic, you know? She held up an almost transparent little sheet, or towel, or some such thing in front of her, and began her dance. And I noticed when she spun around that she wasn't wearing nothing but her dancing shoes, and that the rest of her hair also came in the very same rows of colors. I think that might have been the instant I decided I was hopelessly and eternally in love with her. I couldn't figure out why such a lovely young piece of femininity was working in a carnival. And then it occurred to me that this Nebuchadnezzar feller had probably kidnapped her when she was just a little girl, before she'd blossomed into the fullness of womanhood, so to speak, and that she was just waiting for some handsome hero type to rescue her from this life of enforced slavery and take her home so she could dance every night just for him as a way of showing her gratitude. 
I waited until her dance was over, and then it took another five minutes for the audience to stop cheering and stomping and whistling, and finally the bubble emptied out, and I hopped onto the stage and found the little exit at the back and walked through it, and a few seconds later I found myself in the siren's dressing room. She was sitting stark naked on a little stool that floated in front of a vanity, and a tri-dimensional mirror brushing her multicolored hair. There were dozens of hollows of her in various states of dress and undress on the walls, and a couple of missives which were either love letters or glowing testimonials. There were a bunch of little fussy dolls on a shelf, and a row of ugly-looking porcelain dogs that yipped a non-stop musical tune, and some paintings of big-eyed alien children who all looked pretty much alike, even though a couple were four-armed and one was insectoid and another was a chlorine breather. When the siren finally saw my reflection in her mirror, she turned to face me. Who are you? She demanded either totally forgetting that she wasn't wearing nothing, or else not much caring about it. I'm Catastrophe Baker, here to declare my everlasting love for you, and to rescue you from a life of indentured servitude, I told her. I'm flattered, she said, looking me up and down. But I don't want to be rescued. That's because old Doc Nebuchadnezzar has brainwashed you, I explained. Spend a few months traveling the galaxy with me, and you'll be as good as new. What do you say, Siren? I say no, and my name's not Siren. What is it then, I asked. If we're going to spend a lifetime of sexual rapture together, I suppose it's one of the things I ought to know. It's Melora, and we're not going to spend any time together at all. Melora, I repeated. It must be fate. What must be? I've always had a soft spot for naked sirens named Melora, I said. Purtiest name in the universe, if you ask me. I didn't ask you, she said. Now go away. I can't leave you to this life of misery. I'm deliriously happy here, said Melora. I've only been miserable for the past three minutes. You're looking at this all wrong, I explained. I'm in the hero business. At least when I ain't running from various gendarmes. And that means one of the things I do is rescue damsels in distress. I'm not in distress, she insisted. Now leave me alone. How can I leave you alone, I said. I'm in love with you. Well, I'm not in love with you, she shot back. That's because you don't hardly know me, I said. After ten or twelve years of fun and hijinks together, you'll fall like a ton of bricks. What does it take to make you leave? She demanded. I realized then that my approach had been all wrong. That she viewed me as just another unwashed and uncouth member of her audience. So I figured it was probably time to display my class and erudition by saying something poetic that would sweep her off her feet. I racked my mind trying to remember some of the more touching love stories I'd read as an adolescent, and finally I hit upon a phrase that I just knew would win her over. Melora, I said, placing a hand over my heart to indicate my sincerity. My throbbing love engine cries out for you. You can take your throbbing love engine and shove it. She snarled. That's exactly what I had in mind, I replied, pleased that my little ploy was working. I'm glad to see we're thinking along the same lines. She stood up and walked to a wall, took a robe off a hook, wrapped it around her, and faced me with her hands on her hips. I'm asking you for the last time. Are you going to leave peacefully? Peacefully, yes, I said. Alone, (laughs) no. All right, she said. But don't say you weren't warned. She opened her mouth and gave forth a scream that just got higher and higher and louder and louder. Pretty soon the mirror cracked and a bunch of little glass doodads on the vanity shattered. And by the time she reached M over high Q, all the fillings had fallen out of my teeth. And she still kept it up. I could hear people howling in pain outside the tent, 
and then I couldn't hear nothing anymore. And the next thing I knew, she was slapping my face and telling me to wake up. What happened? I mumbled. All the porcelain dogs had shattered, so at least the experience wasn't a total loss. They don't call me the Siren of Silverstrike for nothing, said Melora with a satisfied look on her face. Okay, so you're a siren, I said, running my tongue gingerly over all the holes in my teeth. What did you have to do that for? Because I'm not going anywhere and you needed convincing. But why not? I persisted. She stared at me. Because I'm old Doc Nebuchadnezzar. I own this show, and nothing pulls in more money than the Siren of Silverstrike. Now do you understand? Why didn't you just say so in the first place, I said. If you can't go, I'll just move in with you. This time she hit H over high Z. I like living alone, she said when she'd slapped me awake again. You're one of the hardest ladies to romance that I've ever encountered, I said. But Catastrophe Baker don't give up easy. Well, she screamed three or four more times and I kept passing out. And finally, some of the townsfolk came by and asked her to stop because she busted every window within three miles. Now will you leave? She asked, staring at me when I woke up again. All right, all right, I get the picture, I said. But the day will come when you'll regret throwing away such a perfect and unselfish love as I'm offering you in exchange for just 50% of the carnival's take. But nothing could budge her and I soon saw that I'd been blinded by her physical beauty, or maybe even just by her dye job, and after seeing a dentist and getting my fillings replaced, I went back out amongst the stars. A couple of days older, and a little lonelier, and a lot wiser. Okay, thanks for listening to the story, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. <laughs> thanks, announcer man. Um, <laughs> I did too. <laughs> that was me. It wasn't announcer man. Oh, what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so we just wanted to thank uh, Renee for lending her voice to today's episode. Absolutely. It's been too long. You know, this is kind of a sad episode in a way because we've always had author's notes to go with our stories, and the only time we don't play them is when it's a story that either you or I wrote because then, you know... The whole, whole episode. episode is the author's note. But in this case, it's no longer possible. That's just a bummer. Yeah, I mean, Mike Resnick, I don't know how, if he thinks of us as friends or if he thought of us as friends, but I definitely felt that way with him. I think, did you say that at the start of the show? Did you say, and friend of the show, Mike Resnick? Yes, I called him that on <laughs> the day he died. And then, yeah, and in this introduction as well. But, you know, it, it's not like we have somebody swearing that they're a friend of the show. But when they do nice things for us, we consider them to be a friend of the show. And Mike definitely did that. Um, I mean, we've always been a... A shoestring production held together with duct tape and chewing gum. So we haven't had money to pay authors much. Uh, we would pay, we paid a, a fair amount to begin with, and that was just coming out of my bank account. I blew a lot of money on this show when we first started the show, and I didn't have the money to blow either at the time. I made less money then 
than now, and yet I paid more then than now, so I was really asking for it. You know, eventually we had to lower it down further and further so that we could keep going. And Mike was happy just to donate stories to the show. These last Catastrophe Baker stories, he didn't ask for us to pay for each one of them. He was just like, oh yeah, yeah, here, here, here's a bunch. Do all of them. We may, I don't know how many Catastrophe Baker stories in total he wrote. We may have the lion's share of them in our email that he wanted us to just do audio versions of. And I guess, you know, once you do a bunch of them, it's almost like, you know, I kind of feel like I am <laughs> Catastrophe Baker. I am the voice of Catastrophe Baker. I am Frank Welker doing <laughs> Megatron or something like that when I do Catastrophe Baker. Uh, which is cool. You know, that's that's kind of neat. Uh, I don't know if anybody else feels that way or, you know, someday his estate will come to me like hey uh we're doing an audiobook of catastrophe baker and since you are the voice of catastrophe baker we want well, you to... i certainly felt that way when i heard that he had passed i was just like okay well i guess i'll have to sit down and record one of these stories and then i was just like i, I can't do that i'm not catastrophe baker <laughs> It's just interesting, and it's neat to have that experience. It's it's really a cool feeling. It's also special just to have an author that is this high profile of an author that has deigned to <laughs> acknowledge that we exist. You know what I mean? We we're always totally such a small-time operation, and for him to do that is just, it's cool. You know, it's it's it makes me feel special. It makes me feel like I I matter, even if I don't, and I I really don't. Wow, you and I have switched places, <laughs> sir, because I was just about to say, the first story that we ever produced by Mike Resnick was the Princess of Earth. Uh huh. And it was the first time we ever got nominated for a Parsec Award. Yeah. I was doing his story. And uh, yeah, go go back and check that episode out if you don't remember it. I remember we had an animated GIF as our cover art <laughs> for the first and only time. And, yeah, uh, I think I you added told the me, snow effect onto it. <laughs> yeah, you told me that you took a picture of Captain Britain. That's right. And superimposed him into the snow, and for some reason I've never forgotten that. Uh, <laughs> while everybody else forgot who Captain Britain was. Right. But, we, yeah, we got nominated for a Parsec Award for that episode. And the thing that I knew Mike Resnick for was he wrote a bunch of stories that they ran over on Escape Pod. Right. And that was I, before we even existed as a podcast. Uh, both of us were fans of Escape Pod. I think you introduced me to it. And they would run these Mike Resnick stories... And they were always heartbreaking stories. Uh, yeah. These just these immensely sad, profound stories about loss and about old age and about regret. Good, good stuff. And uh, I'm sure it was you, not me, that wrote Mike and said, you know, oh, we... We really liked this story that you did on uh, Escape Pod. Do you have any stories that we could do on our show, on our fledgling show? And so Mike wrote us back and he said, sure, but all the other podcast wants to run are these sad stories that I've written. And I don't just write sad stories. Would you be interested in running a funny story <laughs> and i'm remembering it that this was you that said this to him but it could easily have been me i said yeah we'll run any story yeah just just <laughs> just send it and 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 yeah we'd be happy to to run anything because we were fans uh, how how many stories would you say escape pod ran while we were listening to the show and big fans of that podcast 
Uh, well, I was actually going back and looking at them. They they ran at least 11 stories of Mike Resnick's on their show before our show even had its first episode. So, a bunch. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. But anyhow, yes, uh, he very uh, generously sent us Princess of Earth, and we ran it, and it was very well received. Yeah. Uh, and, and rightly so. Uh, you know, I think I told the story wrong, though, because Princess of Earth was a tearjerker. I'm not sure if he asked us if we wanted the funny story immediately or if it was after he sent us the Princess of Earth. He may have said, here is this story, a Princess of Earth, but you know I also do funny stories. Would you like one of those? Yeah, that, you're remembering it a little better than I did. Yeah, that, that's what happened. Is we, He sent us a sad story because that's all he does. <laughs> and we ran it, and it was great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and then he's like, you know, I have a sense of humor. I'm not just the death guy. Uh, and so, yeah, he sent It was us, like Steve Buscemi. He's like, what? Why do you keep casting me as the creepy psycho guy? And so, yeah, he sent us the Catastrophe Baker story. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 90... Okay, I'm 100% sure you produced that very first Catastrophe Baker story. And uh, I don't know if people liked it or not. Kind of the only thing that I remember is that I liked it. I, I thought that, <laughs> that it was funny. And... Uh, uh huh. And we ran it, and maybe it wasn't to everyone's taste, but yeah, it was just really cool that he shared that with us and uh, liked our production enough to say, okay, here's another one, and here's another one, and here is, yeah, you guessed it, another one. It just, that was really cool. Yeah, it was neat, like I said before, to have somebody that was willing to acknowledge us somebody who how, well, let's see mike resnick won five hugo awards and was nominated for 37 in a row he probably was he he may have had more than one nomination per year even <laughs> to rack up that many nominations and then he was also he also won a Nebula Award and was nominated eleven times for that. You know, someone that has that kind of status, I guess it's really neat that he would be willing to send us his. Yeah, here, here you go. I enjoyed your production of Catastrophe Baker. Here's a bunch more. <laughs> Have that big dumb Anklevich guy do his dumb accent some more. And, uh... See, you know he listened if he said big dumb Anklevich guy. <laughs> yeah, that was a direct quote. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was just, it was nice to have that. When it comes down to it, I think Mike Resnick was a big reason why we had... A podcast in the first place because like rich was saying earlier we both were fans of escape pod before we ever started our show we used to listen to escape pod yeah i went back to episode one of escape pod and downloaded a bunch of them and then listened to them through on my drives to work and then downloaded a bunch more and listened to them and downloaded a bunch more and after listening to uh, i think they probably had about 200 episodes before we even started and you would hear some authors over and over again. And I was pretty much a newbie when it came. You know, I knew some authors. I, I had read sci-fi growing up and stuff like that. And I knew a fair number of authors, but I wasn't really that knowledgeable. I didn't know who most of the authors were that would come up on the list. And so if Mike Resnick came up, I wouldn't be like, oh, wow, this is going to be good. He's been nominated for 37 Hugos and 11 Nebula Awards. You know, I would just be like, oh, Mike Resnick. Yeah, that name sounds vaguely familiar. Did he do a story already? And each time I would listen to a story and I'd be like, ooh, that one was good. And then I would look and see the, the name and be like, oh, 
I think I've heard that guy's stories before. And then I would listen, you know, to 10 more episodes. And there was another Mike Resnick story in there. And I'd be like, ooh, that one was good. And then they started doing their Hugo Award uh, preview shows uh, that they would do every year where they'd get the short story nominations uh, for the Hugo Awards and they would produce audio versions of them all. And you would always get another, an extra Mike Resnick story that way because Mike Resnick always had one up for a Hugo. And it got me, you know, listening to stories like his got me excited about doing a podcast, about doing readings. You know, Rish already would do readings of his own stories. And I already worked in media production so I, I figured that we could easily do that ourselves. And I kept thinking, man, we should do this. This would be cool. We could produce cool stories like the 43 Antarian Dynasties or Travels with My Cats or Me and My Shadow. You know, all the stories that I'd loved on Escape Pod. And yeah, I actually did get that opportunity because we went for it. And uh, it was cool. You know, it, it, it was, it was, uh, it, it turned out well, I guess, because here we are <sighs> 11 years later almost. No, 12 years later almost. And we're still doing it. So, yeah. And, and when it comes down to it, yeah, we can say that a lot of, the the fact that the show exists at all we owe to Mike Resnick and his his fiction it makes me really sad to think that he's gone uh you know I haven't talked about it I suppose on our show yet but a very short time ago my own father passed away uh you know I had to deal with loss and with grief and all of those kind of things. This past month has been a lot of that. And Mike Resnick doesn't hit the same uh, <laughs> level of uh, loss for me as my own father. But it really is, uh, you know, he was important to me. And it, and it it's kind of, it's sad to know that he's gone because he wasn't that old. 77, right? So, you know, he, he still could have had a, a lot of years to go, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, things like cancer don't necessarily care how old you are. I know because my mom was only 50 when it took her. So, you know, that can happen. Um, it's just a shame. And, uh, you know, he's gone too soon. But we can remember the the good times, the good things. And the great thing about Mike Resnick is he left a lot of work behind. And he can continue to enrich and enhance our lives for years to come. You know, he's got dozens of books and dozens upon dozens of short stories and novellas and novelettes and so on and so forth. So... A, a big contribution to the world. Do you have in front of you any kind of number as far as how many stories the man wrote or published? It doesn't say anything like that on his wiki page. Although it does say, Resnick wrote over 200 erotic adult novels under various <laughs> pseudonyms. <laughs> and uh, wow, we need to figure out what those pseudonyms are. <laughs> yeah, I just love that idea. That wow. It does say he wrote 70 novels, more than 70 novels and published over 25 collections. Wow. Do you see the the list of short fiction titles? But yeah, look at the size of that. And that is not all of them because like I was saying, Catastrophe Baker the three Catastrophe Baker stories that are even on that list are Canticle for Leibowitz, Makes First Contact, and Cold The Cold Equations. Equations. All the rest of those that we have aren't even on here. <laughs> well, dude, that is just... I don't know if I'm using this word correctly, 
but it's aspirational. Oh, it would be great to have so many stories that uh, nobody can keep track of them all, that the fans would constantly be discovering new ones, stumbling over erotica novels written under a pseudonym. <laughs> we, need to, we need to track down all of his erotica novels. <laughs> Maybe I need to take that uh, in mind as a career path. <clears throat> Me too. I'm, I, I'm thinking of uh, writing an erotica novel under the pseudonym Martian Latham. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if we want to even talk about the story. They're short. They're very short. Uh, of the three that I read today, uh, the longest one was, oh, gosh, what, 20, 2,600 words, something like that? Oh, okay. There was a 1,600 word one, and then this one was only eighteen hundred words right and yeah i wonder about stuff like that i recently did an hp lovecraft story over on my podcast and you know a little bit of trivia about hp lovecraft is he was paid by the word (laughs) you could tell in that story and uh yeah this feels like like it could have been way way longer and uh he just nope. That's the story I wanted to tell. There you go. Now on to the next one. Yeah, he was he was paid by the story for this one because <laughs> he did not unnecessarily drag it out. He got a flat fee on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but the, that's the fun thing that I mean, you and I are both writing a great deal right now. You're writing every single day uh, of the year, right? I'm trying to. And uh, because you're all ambitious and into writing, you know, I've been trying to as well. And I go to the library whenever I can. I went today, sit down and write. Yeah, you could just create new stories all the time. I, I read an interview with him where he talked about the pulp era and these writers that just, you know, were putting them out as fast as they could because the... The market was so hungry for stories, and he was too young to have participated in that. But sure enough, once the erotica field started up, it was like that with him. It was just like, well, how many can you get out? And he's like, well, how, how good do they have to be? And the, the editors were like, we, I didn't say good. How fast can you get it out? <laughs> That that's amazing. That idea of the the marketplace is just so the the demand way exceeds the supply, and so you're just like, okay, I'll sit down and write another one today. I love that idea. Yeah, uh, I I found this story to be fun. I mean, it's been a long time since we've done one of these, I guess. So. Maybe I just missed old Catastrophe Baker. I did really have a good time doing his voice and doing the accent and all that stuff again. But he's such a dopey, yet super in love with himself kind of a kid. He thinks he's the greatest thing in the world. And sometimes I guess he is. He's he's one of those tall tale kind of guys that can do anything. He can punch out anybody. He can uh, lasso the moon. I don't know. <laughs> he can romance every woman that there is. But the funny thing is, yeah, he, he, he assumes that he can do that. But in this case, he's just not getting it that this woman is just not interested at all. And he just keeps bumbling along. And she's just like, eh, go away. And he doesn't understand. He's like, what? You want me to not take you out into the universe? Okay, I guess I can move in here. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I, I found it to be funny just how he plain doesn't understand it. I, I feel like I should go back and listen to some of the older ones and, and see if some of that, I, that feels like a new twist to Catastrophe Baker, him being too dumb. Uh, it, it feels to me, maybe I don't remember quite right, but I remember all the old stories. Yeah, every woman wanted him because he was so amazing. Yeah, this one felt like a little bit like an outlier, and that's why I wanted to do this one. But there is that sense of 
him just being this big ox right who's so strong and you know, it's just like i tried to ignore the screams of the people i pushed gently pushed out of the way you know that kind of stuff that was in other stories yeah. as well where it's just like uh, maybe i shook his hand a little too hard because he was rolling on the floor screaming he has limitless strength and limitless vitality and limitless uh what do you call it? A magnetism with women. And yeah, this one uh, ended up with uh, him being turned away. And I felt like that was unique enough that it's like, oh, well, okay. How does he handle that? Yeah, I found it to be a fun story. Humorous, again, as they all have been. But this one was humorous and in, in it feels like a new way. But yeah, I guess... Now that he's gone, I can use him as a sort of, like you were saying, aspirational. I, c I can aspire to be like Mike Resnick, write as much as he does, and publish as much as he did. Aspire to be what Mike Resnick is. That would be neat. Yeah, I went to the library, like I said, and I looked to see what they had by Mike Resnick, and... They had a hardcover book of his with the the copyright of 2019 on it. I just was astounded that a hardcover book in my podunk library that recently, you know, really, really great. I know that the, he's got a book called Master of Dreams that's coming out in March. He's got a book called The Mistress of Illusions in April of 2020. So, you know, it's possible that... Uh, he will continue to get Hugo nominations. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Further cementing his record. Yeah, I'm very thankful to have been associated with Mike Resnick in any way. And, you know, I guess that's what uh, I'm here to say in this show. Is that, you know, it was really cool, you know, to be a part of, of his body of work in, in some way. I'm really grateful that I was able to do that. And we'll miss him. It's uh, unfortunate that he's gone, but I'm glad that we have so much of his work to be able to uh, continue to enjoy for the rest of our lives. It's, it's, it's great. Hear, hear. And yeah, just not to, uh, to ring our own bell. What, what, what is it that you do that you're not supposed to do? Well, whatever you're not supposed to do, I'm about to do, but he must have liked what we did with his stuff and, and liked our sense of humor or our personalities enough to say, well, these guys, I think, can pull off these sort of farcical space western stories that I wrote. Their sensibilities, they, they will not be offended, but they will take it in, you know, in the spirit in which it was intended. And, uh, and so... There we go. Hopefully we made him laugh. We made him appreciate his own work in, in the way that you do when somebody else presents it to you. Yeah, that's cool. Toot our own horn. That's what I was doing that we weren't supposed to be doing. Uh, toot your own horn. See, I was thinking you can pick your nose. And you can pick your friends. But you can't pick your friend's nose. Or Those... wait, was it you can prick your finger, but you can't finger your prick <laughs> <laughs> all right i guess we've reached the end is there more you wanted to say before we go nope absolutely not i think you're pricking your finger at the end uh and and that's where we should leave things it's a great way to come full circle back around to the poor form that we showed in starting this episode <laughs> 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 all right everybody thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed today's story and our reminiscence about mike resnick uh we'll let you go your way and i have been big anklevich and i've been rich outfield thank you big and good night mike rest in peace The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it.
If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donated. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. Take two. Catastrophe Baker and the Siren of Silver Strike. Right? That's the right title, right? <laughs> it better be. Okay. We just recorded it. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't you know, miss a word or two or, or something in it. I don't have it open on my uh, desktop anymore. Let me see if I can find it real quick just to make sure. No, no, no. I, my, uh, Catastrophe Baker and the Siren of Silver Strike. Okay, so that's right. I just want to make sure there wasn't uh, extra ands or buts or ifs or something in there. It all began when I decided to pay a visit to my old friend, Bloody Ben Masters, who'd been the first one to hit pay dirt. I was right, damn it, I shouldn't have stopped. Seemed he'd got a snootful one night and decided he'd see if he could swim in the moat without taking a breath. Oh, wow, that's funny that I ran out of breath <laughs> on that line. <laughs> Trying again. And it was striped with rows of iridescent colors. Red, blue, and yellow, and green. I'm saying and, and there isn't any and there. Let me try that again. And the pattern repeated a couple of times. Real striking and artistic, you know? Silver striking and artistic, for that matter. There were a bunch of little pussy dolls. Oh, whoops, fussy dolls. <clears throat> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I shouldn't have used such language. She stood up and walked to a wall, took a robe off a hook, wrapped... <laughs> Poor Catastrophe Baker, he's been fooled for the first time. Who knew that such thing could happen? I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.